due to various reasons, which have taken place over the last 20 to 30 years. Stanley Hauerwa says that the church now carries a new burden of proof. There has been that increase, rise in the nuns, those who claim no religious affiliation because they have witnessed scandal, experienced judgmentalism, or faced unfair disapproval by the church. So now we have to demonstrate or prove the sincerity of our compassion. And under those kinds of circumstances, it's easy to take on this defensive posture where we stand up in the courtroom and hit the table and say, I object that we want to argue our side of the story, that we are compassionate. Don't you see? The only problem is When we look at the life of Jesus, we do not see a defensive posture. But he doesn't have an offensive stance either. He's not going around trying to prosecute the other side. He steps outside of the courtroom altogether. He is simply focused on his calling and purpose. Which is why Psalm 139 is so valuable to us. That it has a way of reaching deep down inside of us and touching something important where that poetry says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. That we are fearfully and wonderfully made created with purpose and calling. It might have been a few years since we last played pin the tail on the donkey, but we can go back and still remember what it's like to have that blindfold tied around us. And then someone who's enjoying it more than they should, spins us around for what feels like a hundred times. And then we pause. But the room is still spinning. And we are trying to get our bearings, to figure out which direction we used to be facing. That when we feel that new burden of proof as a church, It is disorienting. We don't know what to say. We're not sure what to do. We don't know where our bearings are. But we find them again by remembering our purpose and calling. And in that story from 1 Samuel, which is referred to as the calling of Samuel, because he goes on to carry that title prophet, to name the first kings of Israel. But in this story, we find Samuel very far from that title. It was during a time where it says the word of God was rare. That either God was silent or hidden or ignored. And it says, Samuel had not yet encountered God. But he's there helping the priest Eli. And Samuel's a great help because Eli's eyesight is failing him. But it says, 
the lamp of God in the temple has not gone out. It is meant to show this contrast in the story where we can't always trust our assumptions or our uncertainty. That whereas Eli's eyesight is failing, the light of God has not gone out. And whereas people have not heard from God, God is going to speak to Samuel. And then one evening, Samuel hears this voice, Samuel, Samuel, and he gets up and he goes running to Eli. And Eli, a little disoriented, because he didn't call out, says, go lie back down. Well, this happens two more times. And finally, that seasoned experience of Eli says, when you hear this voice again, simply say, speak, Lord for your servant is listening. And this story about the calling of Samuel is atypical when we look at all the stories about calling throughout the pages of Scripture. Because so often in the pages of Scripture, a calling comes with specific instructions. Think about Moses who's told to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Or Jonah, who is given a map, and he's supposed to go to Nineveh to speak of repentance to the Assyrians. But in this story, there are no instructions for Samuel, which turns out to be quite helpful to us. Because at its very core. A calling is not about a specific task. It is about a way of life. So if you want to know about a calling, don't ask a minister. A minister with this knee-jerk reaction will start telling you about a calling to a specific task. If you want to know about a calling, ask someone in the pew, like Samuel, who's going to talk about a way of life. And if you asked anybody in the early church, they would describe a calling simply as the Christian faith. And it was that way for the first several hundred years because they felt called from no faith or a different faith to this new way of life that they started to call the Christian faith. And that may not be our experience. Many of us may have grown up in the church running around these hallways, but a calling is always to a new way of life. But all of that changed in the early church when Emperor Constantine declared Christianity the official religion of Rome, which came with his own set of problems. That if you were born a Roman citizen, you were simply born into Christianity. You were born into the roles of the church, never giving it much thought. But at its core, a calling is to a way of life. And we should never underestimate the power of purpose. Victor Frankl writes, Life is never made unbearable by circumstances, but only by lack of meaning and purpose. Adam Hamilton reminds us that Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. That in 1942, Victor and his family were sent to a concentration camp. Victor survived. 
His family did not. And afterwards, he felt compelled to write the book, Man's Search for Meaning, or by its original title, Saying Yes to Life in Spite of Everything that in the concentration camp, he observed that if prisoners were able to hold on to that belief that their lives, in fact, were still significant, that they were fearfully and wonderfully made, it helped them to persevere. And in his medical practice, based on these observations, he developed an approach that helped countless people who were ready to give up on life. And we find deeper meaning and purpose in the ways of Jesus, where we are all called to compassion and kindness, meekness and gentleness, justice and forgiveness. Matthew Crawford is a motorcycle mechanic and he holds a doctorate in political philosophy from the University of Chicago. He's worked in a think tank and in a garage. And he says he has learned as much from being a mechanic as he did a PhD student. He says the reason for that is old bikes don't flatter you, they educate you. Because they don't follow a manual. You have to learn along the way. There'll be these bolts that are rusted and you have to figure out how to loosen them. Or there will be parts that are no longer available and you have to improvise. That There'll be dents in the motorcycle that make it difficult to take apart and even harder to put back together. And the ways of Jesus... Do not flatter us. They educate us. That we learn by doing them. It's why we talk about the word become flesh. That we lean into that calling that we all share. And we learn by showing up by walking alongside others, by listening, by changing, by making sacrifices. That we cannot learn those things standing at a safe distance. We learn by interacting, by asking, by assisting. And we can begin by remembering that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. That we have this purpose and calling which can guide us through all manner of circumstances. Never making us defensive but always leading us forward. Amen.